This lecture will go over the end portion of chapter 31, starting with rhinosinusitis on page 610. Rhinosinusitis, when you think rhino, you should be thinking the nose. Rhinosinusitis is an inflammation of the mucous membranes of one or more of the sinuses and is usually seen with rhinitis, especially with the common code known as, also known as coryza. Anything that interferes with sinus drainage can lead to rhinosinusitis. Even when the problem starts with a non-infectious cause, such as seasonal allergies, swelling usually blocks the flow of secretions from the sinuses, which may then become infected. Diagnosis is made based on the patient's history and symptoms, but other tests and complicated cases include endoscopic examination and CT scans. Plain x-rays are not helpful in viewing the sinuses and are not recommended. Purulent drainage, fever, and lack of response to decongestants can indicate a bacterial infection. Common symptoms of rhinosinusitis include pain over the cheek radiating to the teeth, tenderness to percussion over the sinuses, referred pain to the temple or back of the head, and general facial pain that is worse when bending forward. Additional symptoms and bacterial infections include purulent nasal drainage with postnasal drip, sore throat, fever, erythema, swelling, fatigue, dental pain, and ear pressure. Drug therapy commonly includes decongestants and intranasal steroid spray. Antihistamines, leukotriene inhibitors, and mast cell stabilizers block or reduce the amount of chemical mediators in nasal and sinus tissues and prevent local edema and itching. Decongestants constrict blood vessels and decrease edema. Antipyretics are given for fever. Analgesics may be given for pain. You have a green uh, box, considerations for older adults. First-generation antihistamines are potentially inappropriate drugs for use in older adults. In this population, problems with these drugs include reduced drug clearance, high risk for confusion, and anticholinergic effects such as dry mouth and constipation. Your prototype first-generation antihistamine is diphenhydramine that you want to be familiar with. Treatment for bacterial rhinosinusitis includes broad-spectrum antibiotic, decongestants, and antipyretics. Endoscopic sinus, sinus surgery to relieve obstruction and drain sinuses may be needed if non-surgical managements fail to provide relief. Supportive therapies such as humidification, nasal irrigation, and applying hot wet packs over the sinus area can increase the patient's comfort and help prevent the spread of infection. Teach patients, you have a yellow box about making sure that we're teaching patients to finish their entire uh, prescription of antibiotics. Also, we want to instruct patients about the importance of rest and fluid intake of at least 2,000 milliliters per day unless other health problems require fluid uh, restrictions. Humidifying the air can help to relieve congestion. Nasal saline irrigations is an inexpensive treatment with few side effects. Sleep with the head of the bed elevated and avoid cigarette smoke may help to reduce discomfort. If the condition is caused by allergies, limiting exposure to the offending agent is helpful. Teach patients to reduce the risk of spread of infection by thoroughly washing hands, especially after nose blowing, sneezing, coughing, rubbing the eyes, or touching the face. Other precautions include staying at home from work, school, or other crowded places, covering the mouth and nose with a tissue when sneezing or coughing, disposing of used tissues immediately, and avoiding close contact with others. Peritonsillar abscess is a rare complication of acute tonsillitis. The infection spreads from the tonsil to the surrounding tissue and forms an abscess. The most common Bacterial cause of peritonsillar abscess is group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. Signs and symptoms include a collection of pus behind the tonsil causing swelling on one side of the throat, pushing the uvula toward the unaffected side. The patient may have severe throat pain radiating to the ear or teeth, a muffled voice, fever, and difficulty swallowing. He or she may also have a tonic contraction of the muscles of chewing, known as trismus, and difficulty breathing. Bad breath is present, and lymph nodes on the effective side are sw swollen. Diagnosis is usually made based on the patient's symptom, but a needle aspiration and culture of the pus collected is the preferred test. Most patients can be treated as out outpatient with antibiotics. However, antibiotics alone are often ineffective. The patient may need steroids to reduce swelling, and some may need drainage of the, abs of the abscess. Pain control is important. Drugs may include topical anesthetics, over-the-counter analgesics, and opioids. The patient may need liquid drugs because swallowing can be difficult. 
stressed the importance of completing the antibiotic regimen and coming to the emergency department quickly if symptoms of obstruction develop, including drooler and strider. Hospitalization is needed when the airway is endangered or the infection does not respond to antibiotic therapy. A tonsillectomy may be performed to prevent recurrence. Inhalation anthrax is a bacterial infection caused by the gram-positive organism Bacillus anthraxis. This organism lives as a spore in soil where grass-eating animals live and graze. Most cases of anthrax are on the skin. When infection occurs through the lungs, the, the disease is nearly 100% fatal without treatment. It is an occupational hazard for veterinarians, farmers, taxidermists, and others who frequently contact animal wool, hides, bone meal, and skin. Because inhalation anthrax is so rare, any occurrence in a person who does not have an occupational risk is considered an intentional act of bioterrorism. Report the presence of symptoms consistent with inhalation anthrax to hospital authorities immediately. This organism first forms as a spore, an encapsulated organism that is inactive. When many spores are inhaled deeply into the lungs, macrophages engulf them. Once inside the macrophage, the, the organism leaves its capsule and replicates. The active bacteria produce several toxins that are released into the infected tissue and the blood that makes the infection worse. Massive edema occurs along with hemorrhage and destruction of lung cells. Infector mac infected macrophages carry the organism to lymph nodes and the organisms spread rapidly causing bacteremia, sepsis, and meningitis. Lethal toxins produced by the bacteria are the most common cause of death. Inhalation anthrax has two stages, prodromal or incubation period and fulminant with active disease. Um, you can look at chart 31-4 for the key features of the different stages of inhalation anthrax. I'll let you look at those on your own. The prodromal stage symptoms include low-grade fever, fatigue, mild chest pain, and dry, harsh cough. A special fe feature of inhalation anthrax is that it is not accompanied by upper respiratory, uh, upper respiratory symptoms of sore throat or rhinitis. Usually the patient starts to feel better and symptoms improve in two to four days. If the patient begins appropriate antibiotic therapy at this stage, the likelihood of survival is high. Diagnosis can be made with gram stain of the blood or a chest x-ray. The fulminant stage begins after the patient feels a little better. Usually, there is a sudden onset of severe illness, including respiratory distress, hematoemesis, dyspnea, diaphoresis, strider, chest pain, and cyanosis. Hemorrhagic, mediastinitis, and pleural effusions develop. The patient may have decreased level of consciousness and frank shock. The disease spreads through the blood, causing septic shock and hemorrhagic meningitis. Death often occurs within 24 to 36 hours, even if antibiotics are started at this stage. A vaccine is available to be used before exposure occurs, but distribution is limited to specific at-risk adults. Chart 31-5 um, gives examples of common drug therapy for prophylaxis and for treatment that you can review on your own. Pertussis is a respiratory infection caused by, by bacteria. It's also known as whooping cough. It's highly contagious and spreads easily from person to person via respiratory droplets. The disease has three distinct phases. During the first phase, the catarrhal phase, the patient has symptoms resembling the common cold, including a mild cough. After one to two weeks, the paroxysmal stage begins and the patient has severe coughing fits that last for several mi minutes. During the coughing spasms, the patient may turn red and or vomit. He or she is frequently exhausted by the coughing and the distinctive whooping sound common in children at the end of the cough may not be present in adults. There is a bloody, purulent, thick exudate in the small airways that leads to atelectasis and pneumonia. This stage can last up to 10 weeks. The recovery convalescent stage lasts for months. The diagnosis of pertussis can be made based on the patient's reported symptoms, but sputum cultures obtained by deep suctioning and lab testing are also available. The CDC recommends testing for anyone who has had a cough lasting longer than three weeks, and immunizations for pertussis are available. Children receive the DTaP vaccinations, 
and older adults, adolescents and older adults then receive the Tdap vaccination. The P in both of those stands for pertussis. Coccidiodomycosis is a fungal inf infection also known as valley fever. The fungus is present in the soil and is inactive in non-producing non microfilaments. When the soil is disturbed by excavation or dust storms, the microfilaments become airborne. When the microfilaments are inhaled, they change into the re reproductively active spore form of the organism. Symptoms of coccidio coccidiomycosis resemble other respiratory infections such as fever, cough, headache, muscle aches, chest pains, and night, and night sweats. Bone and joint pains may indicate more severe infection. Neither antibacterial or antiviral drugs are effective for therapy because, again, coccidiodomycosis is caused by a fungus. The disease can become widespread and cause, cause symptoms of hemoptysis, meningitis, and involve the skin, adrenal glands, liver, and spleen. Most younger, healthy adults recover from the infection without treatment. For moderate infection, oral therapy with an antifungal agent can be used. And if you notice on 613, a lot of the endings for those antifungal medications end in A-Z-O-L-E. You want to recognize those as antifungals. Because the infection is not spread from person to person, isolation precautions are not required. In endemic areas, adults at high risk are those who work in or around soil, such as farm workers or construction workers. Go ahead and pause the video and read over the case study, and then we'll go through the questions that relate back to this case study. All right, question one from the case study. Um, you can pause it and go ahead and read where you're at and then read your question and pick out your best answer. So for this first question of the case study, if you picked the answer B, that is the correct answer. All the patient's vital signs are abnormal. However, the most important one to report immediately is her increased respirations and decreased oxygen saturation. Even though a diagnosis has not been confirmed, it's very important to address these problems. The patient is experiencing tachypnea. Go ahead and do the same thing for this second case study question. If you picked the answer B, that is the correct answer. All of the provider's orders are very important. However, the most important one is oxygen therapy. Hypoxia is often seen with pneumonia, so it's very important that supplemental oxygen is started as soon as possible. IV fluids should be started to enhance um, pulmonary toileting or, or help thin out secretions. Uh, the laboratory should be notified to draw the needed blood cultures. UAP can obtain specimen for your, your analysis. The blood cultures, cultures and the UA should be obtained before the IVP and ANSEF is administered. For this final question, the patient has developed problems with the airway. Intervention should include helping her cough and deep breathe at least every two hours, teaching incentive spirometry every hour while awake, encouraging the patient to consume three liters of fluid per day, monitoring INOs, and administering bronchodilators if ordered. Question one, read through here if I can get it and um, come up with your answer. Huh. There you go, go ahead and read it, pause the video. If you chose C, that's the correct answer. The older adult with pneumonia has weakness, fatigue, lethargy, confusion, and poor appetite. Fever and cough may be absent, but hypoxemia is usually present. The most common manifestation of pneumonia in the older adult, older patient is confusion from hypoxia rather than fever or cough. Question two. The correct answer is D. Question three. The correct answers are A, C, and D.